It's a pleasure to be back. Here. This is the fourth talk I've given for the Greenwich Village Society of Historic Preservation. This is the first time I've actually said the whole name correctly. Uh, I want to thank a few people for um, this evening. One is Ted Force, who many of you know is uh, not just the linchpin, a linchpin of the GVSAP, but also oddly and wonderfully connected to many of our lives in, in um, unexpected and, and beautiful ways. So I think partly Ted, if Ted Minot didn't live in New York City, New York City wouldn't work. <laughs> uh, I also want to thank NYU for letting us use this space. I run a master's program called the Draper Program, and my staff helped with some of the logistics for tonight. So Nicole Gandolfo and Joanna Byrne, I thank them as well. Uh, you will notice, I hope you notice the hot chocolate out, mm -hmm. outside. Please feel free to go get a refill. I won't be offended if you get up and down during while I'm talking. It's, uh, we always have a lot left over. When I talked about snow a couple of years ago, we had gallons of it left over. And that's fine, it doesn't go to waste, but it's for you all. So drink your fill. Um, I think that's all I meant to say for now. There are a couple of people in the audience that I will point out to you a little bit later, I don't want to put them on the spot just now, but um, <coughs> let me just say that if I make mistakes, they will correct me, and I'm grateful for that. So what I'm going to talk about tonight is a way in which snow, as a specific example of weather, has a profound impact not just on the life of the city in the moment that the snow falls, and then that we have to deal with it, but how it has a larger and quite long-lasting political and infrastructural and economic and historic uh, consequence that then plays out until it bumps into the next set of problems with the next big, big storm. Um, so I, as you can imagine, if you research the entire history of snow in New York, that's volumes unto itself. I'm not going to bore you with details of things like the 1717 storm, about which there are not that many illustrations, But you can go back, and since Europeans arrived, and, and really in meteorological history, you can go back even farther than that, and look at what snow, winter more generally, but snow in particular, has done to this region. So we're going to focus on the, the city part. One of the things that makes New York especially vulnerable to certain kinds of storms, certain really devastating kinds of storms, is this geographical, uh, I want to say aberration, but it's simply a feature of the eastern seaboard. Where Long Island and then the northern part of New Jersey, where they come together, is a nearly perfect right angle. And when storms blow up the coast and they get to this corner, imagine a car that's gone revving up uh, a street and hits a dead end or, or a sharp right turn that doesn't turn, but the engine doesn't shut off and instead it just revs higher and higher and higher. So when that happens, you get storms that are already perhaps quite concentrated that become even more intense. So that's, that's how that right angle works. It's, it, it becomes a funnel. As a result, you have storms that on to the forecasters look like, you know, they're going to be serious, but nothing to, to stockpile food for or to be nervous about. But then it, hits, it can hit that, the New York bite and become something close to a ca catastrophe. Uh, these storms are not necessarily <laughs> catastrophic, but I like how the illustrations let us give us a sense of the kind of uh, uh, sort of chaos of basic movement that snow could cause. And of course, we don't rely on sleds anymore, but <laughs> that would be a marvelous thing. <laughs> these are other years that had storms that were significant enough that they made it into the local press. Look at how the this is eight horses, right? I, I want to point out that the Sanitation Workers Union uh, is uh, Teamsters Local 831. The symbol of it is two horse heads back to back because the Teamsters were formed in the latter part of the 19th century as men who had the skill and knowledge to handle teams of horses. And that was a skill that was hard won and as is often the case with labors that involve uh, animal power and some of the details that go along with that, it was not accorded a very high status. But when you see a Teamster logo, 
this is the this is the genesis of it. knowing how to master teams of horses. People, I was I was delighted when I found that out, and one of you just had a little point of a gas. Oh yeah, that's okay. Mm -hmm. So uh, okay, great. Well now you know. So we this is a this is a contraption that was. Uh, this is from 1896, and this was a moment of some innovation in New York City uh, snow fighting technology. Um, it's, it's supposed to be a plow. I think since we've never seen anything like it since, it probably didn't work very well. <laughs> I'm going to tell a quick story about how this technology, not this technology, but snow fighting and snow melting technology was used in the city in, uh, a little bit earlier than this, in 1886. There was a, a company, they called themselves the New York Snow Melting Company, and they came up with a contraption, according to the New York Times in 1886, this was a mysterious looking machine drawn by six powerful horses. It resembled somewhat an immense sarcophagus or a crematory on wheels, while a large cylinder extended along the top that lent a decidedly warlike appearance to the whole affair. So this contraption, Six horses, right? On a very cold day with snow on the ground, is traveling lower Manhattan looking for a source of water. So they get to a hydrant that, um, they, but they don't have a permit to use the water. And that, that connects to the whole story of water in New York, which is not for tonight, but is a fascinating story unto itself. So they, they wrestle with the cop, uh, verbally argue the cop for two hours for this one hydrant. And then they finally give up and go to another hydrant. But it's at the fish market, and the water is metered. And the watchman, will not let them open that hydrant because they don't, they, someone will have to pay the meter. So then they go to a third hydrant and it's frozen too shut for them to possibly use it. Um, although, for a few moments, the conversation of the managers of the expedition was warm enough to have thawed any but the most <laughs> obdurate hydrants, but it had no effect. So finally, at a fourth hydrant they, uh, on um, near Chambers Street, they chip the ice away, the water flows, the machine is filled, and then they're good to go. So they, this cylinder that's on top of the contraption, they raise this up, it's a smokestack. And uh, they uh, kindle a fire inside the belly of the machine. And then someone says, no, you should move it a block away where you have a better draft for the fire to be hotter. So the horses start again. Half the distance was passed when the lofty smokestack came in contact with an electric light wire. And after a brief struggle between electricity and horsepower, it was ignominiously toppled over into the street. All right, so they fill the, the, the tank with inside the machine with hot water, with water, they heat it, then they shovel in the snow, and then they melt it. The results were not very successful. <laughs> As of five o'clock, after working nearly three hours, and this is after they finally found a hydrant that works, right? The street had been cleaned only halfway down to Liberty. In the opinion of the experts, the process is not likely to revolutionize the system now in vogue. <laughs> and not only that, when they melted the snow and let it run out on the streets of water, it became ice. <laughs> so, in fact, this contraption made the entire problem worse. But, so that's a, a bit long news, but I just wanted to point out that the, the problem of snow and what to do with it, where to put it, and how to melt it, and it's, it, it has vexed us since back in the day. The blizzard of 88, how many of you know about a little bit about the blizzard of 88? So <laughs> please don't get if I get anything wrong. But this is a, a slightly difficult to read image of us and how the storm, um, a, warm, a warm front was coming from the west and then a cold front was coming down from the north and they converged and moved up. As they moved up the coast, they hit the New York Bight and they did that concentrated engine revving thing and within, the statistics are amazing. This was between March 11th and 14th of 1888. By the way, March 11th, the crocuses were already up. The weather forecast was for a balmy weekend, never was looking for to spring. From Chesapeake to Maine and from New York City to Pittsburgh, with winds up to 80 miles an hour, with an average of 35 miles an hour, between 20 and 60 inches of snow fell. And because of the wind with drifts up to 50 and 52 inches, there were 400 fatalities across the Eastern Seaboard, 200 just in New York. Um, and it was more than half a million dollars worth of damage in today's dollars. Um, the New York Times reported on this, of course, well, all of them, all the press did. The wind had the power of slinging snow into doorways and packing it up against the doors and sifting it through the window panes, of piling it up in high drifts 
at street corners and twirling it into hard mounds such as New Yorkers had never seen before. And another source says, no paths, no streets, no sidewalks, no light, no roads, no guests, no calls, no teams, no hacks, no trains, no moon, no meat, no milk, no paper, no mail, no news, no thing, but snow. This was a historic event. This is 14th Street, 120 West 14th Street. Um, this was such a historic event that there was an annual reunion of people who lived through this <laughs> every year until I think the last one actually was, and I don't, I don't know that anyone at the 1988 anniversary had lived through this, but um, this was marked. Um, the Department of Street Cleaning, which is predecessors to the Department of Sanitation, was in charge of clearing all of this. They did a remarkably and um, sort of a, just a, a, an astonishingly bad job. Um, all the available parts that were, uh, they hired lots of carts. The snow had to be dumped off the East River piers, uh, which supposedly, back then you were only supposed to use two locations, but they needed to use all that they had. Boat captains and harbor masters got angry because there were so many carts of snow thrown into the rivers that they formed little icebergs and then blocked shipping traffic. Um, private carters were brought in. Um, this is, a, this is an interesting debate that continues to this day. Should it be only municipal or also private or a combination thereof? Um, yeah, so, and, and this also still happens. City residents often confounded efforts to keep streets, gutters, storm drains, and hydrants free of snow by carelessly tossing snow clear from the sidewalks. Those of you who drive in the city will have seen it happen that the street is clear, clouds have come, but someone has just emptied their driveway or their sidewalk and suddenly there's a big mountain of snow on the little street again. Even back then, this was, a, this was how people behaved. You see all of these wires. This, of course, was a hazard. And this particular image, just to get a sense of scale, those are the people, okay? Oh. These were very susceptible to weather and the weight of the ice and the snow pulled many of them down as, as this this picture shows quite a bit. Um, one of the many long-term consequences of this storm was that all of these poles and wires went underground. It took several years and it took a lot of debate in city, the uh, city council. The other thing that happened is that we, there had been an initiative to put our, our transit system underground, but it had been refused as being practical and expensive, and we have these above ground trains, the L's, why don't we stick with these? But then this storm disabled them completely, and in fact, some of the trains fell off the tracks. There were lots of disasters connected to the trains. So that was also, the storm also had the long term consequence of putting our subway system, sort of one of the last uh, catalysts to get the subway system into motion to, to have it start to be built. This is the one I was looking for. So this is hanging rather precariously from some set of wires, and of course, God forbid someone's underneath it when it comes down. Um, so this was, this was historic, and it was the kind of thing that was, um, any storm that happened after this was compared to this. Was it as big as this? Was it as bad as? Did, was it, were, the, were the winds as ferocious? Were the drifts as high? Um, if you want to learn more about it, these are three quick sources that are useful. Um, the, the one on the bottom, YA means young adults. It's a, um, it's not a, an adult book, but it's it's got great detail. You can also do just a Google search on um, newspaper coverage of this. So, all right. So that's that's a marker in the city's history and its relationship with snow. And one of its consequences was horrific criticism of, rightly so, the Department of Street Cleaning for not clearing the streets. So how do you fix the problem? Well, in 1895, Tammany Hall is thrown out of office. A reform administration has come into power in New York. And a, a fellow named Strong is the mayor, William Strong. And he asks Teddy Roosevelt to be his commissioner of street cleaning. And Teddy Roosevelt says, no way. That's not, no one can do that job. So he's given the police department in commissioner, which was rife with its own problems at the time. And George Waring, a colonel, uh, a Civil War colonel, veteran, and a horseman, was asked to take over street cleaning. <coughs> As it happened, within the first two weeks of his tenure, it snowed. And he marshaled all kinds of labor to get that snow off the ground, almost as it fell. Uh, that, the, the 
the newspaper accounts of the day are quite lovely because they say it was as if they caught it on the shovels <laughs> on its way down. So he proved himself immediately with the chronic challenge that street cleaning and now sanitation has always faced, which is how, how do you deal with a big snowstorm? The men uh, under his command were uh, eventually, actually within the first year, were put into white uniforms. There were a few reasons for this. It wasn't so they would blend in with the snow, <laughs> although they did. Um, the white uniforms, he, he understood very clearly and wanted the public to understand that white as a medical symbol will help you remember that street cleaning is about public health and, and keeping disease under control. And that he gave them the same kind of hats as the uh, police of the day wore. This is a little bit later, this is in the early teens. But so police hats had already changed to this, so did street cleaner hats. Again, to underscore their authority, their public uh, servants, yes, and they're doing a necessary and often difficult job, but they have the authority to tell you, the public, how to do your jobs right uh, in terms of putting out your garbage and also how to take care of things like don't shovel the sidewalk right back into the street. Um, and there was a third reason that he put them in white, which is that uh, the line I like to use is that it's a lot harder to sneak off to the pub for a pint when you're dressed in white. <laughs> so there was a surveillance element to it, and there was quite a lot of pushback on that. But um, he won. So then this is a private carter who has been contracted to pick up snow. And he is being given a ticket for the load that he's carrying in his cart by, oops, sorry, by this guy, who is wearing the white helmet of the department of street cleaning, who is probably an officer, like a supervisor, so a manager, who is going to be in one of the people making sure that the contractors don't rob the city by charging for more cartloads than what they actually were paid, uh, what they actually delivered. The, the um, checks, they were called, if you worked for 10 hours, however many cartloads you could do in 10 hours, you were paid $2 uh, for the day's work. And then if you, so the check would let you get the money. But if you stopped at the pub on the way, and these are not the uniform sanitation people, the street cleaning people, it's these guys, right? If they, at the end of a long, hard day, you're cold, you're tired, you're hungry, you stop in the pub, you often would spend more than $2. And then, but and all you have is this check. So there be, there was quickly a black market in these checks that uh, were supposed to be used to compensate the private laborers, but that in fact ended up, it was a whole, lots of interesting articles about that. Um, the strategy back then and even today is to make piles. When you have enough piles, you take them to the river and dump them. Not We don't dump in the river directly anymore, but we certainly did. Um, well into the 20th century. This, I added this because it's Staten Island, and Staten Island is always left out of the thinking of the city, even though it's a talk supposed to be about the village, but this is near the Seaview Hotel. Um, yeah, it was a very, it was a very hard to that year. Um, when we moved from horses and carts to uh, vehicles like this, by the way, we were not fully mechanized until 1934. We mean, by then the Department of Sanitation. But so it's the same idea, you fill the carts and you go to the the river. This is an, an intriguing uh, way of doing snow. You're on tractors, so you don't need, like, you can imagine that these wooden cartwheels would have a lot of trouble on a slippery street or crossing uh, tram lines and streetcar lines, but the tractor made it more practical, at least enough to, enough to try it. This is an example, this is a picture that you see in, in sanitation offices uh, at, at headquarters. Um, so there's a, a horse and a uh, cart and some a plow kind of thing here. But then, so let's say I'm, I'm in this plow. So I'm going to be relatively sort of in the middle of the street. And then you're in the plow behind me. Sorry, I'm just pointing my pointer at you. You're in the plow behind me, but you're going to be slightly to the right so at an angle. So between the two of us, we cover most of the street. It's called tandem plowing, and it's still the strategy used today. You will see on big avenues or highways, you'll see three or four or five plows. The one on the far left is in front, and then the next one is slightly further back, and the third behind that, and the fourth and the fifth. And the rooster tail that comes off the plow, the one to the next to the next, by the last plow, you have sometimes this, when I was plowing in the Bronx, I, in my memory, I was the fourth of five. And in my memory, my rooster tail was as tall as this ceiling, and the one next was even, it was fantastic. It was, <laughs> you have such power, and you're like, nobody, nobody's going to get your way. You are clearing the highway. I 
swear to goodness, Moses probably had some ten in the clouds with him when he's doing that. Because right? <laughs> just how out, what it would be perfect. So this is ten in the plowing even before they were working on this plow. By the early 20th century, we were still, this, this is, uh, what year is this one? 1908. <laughs> and then this is 1910. We now have um, uh, vehicles that are kind of plow-like, but you notice there's no windscreen, there's no windshield. The job was often very cold. This is a V plow, and I'm going to show you a contemporary V plow in a minute. But this, I, I have not been able to read what it says on the front, but that there's such a lineup of these dignitaries and men in hats, you know, it's probably a pretty serious new innovation uh, for the city's fight with snow. Um, this is another, this is another, again, there's no windscreen here. This is just to show you how some of this stuff evolved. This is the Lower East Side in 1926. There, obviously, they have not seen a flat one yet. <laughs> I would hazard the guess. This is 19, also 1926 on Fifth Avenue. But you see how deep the snow is. So this is something to keep in mind. So this, there's, there's going to be nothing this plow can do that's in any way effective to get down to the asphalt or the cobblestones until this is far less deep. It's still true today. If there's a three-foot drop of snow and you send a plow out now, a V plow will have a, a, a chance. But a conventional plow, when you push, even with a truck that empty is 19 tons, and then you add a, a plow mechanism on front, which is another approximately ton of steel, right? Even with all that mass, the weight of the snow, the, the, truck, the, the plow is not going to be able to do it just pushing it ahead of itself. Um, so the V plow has a better chance. But it's not, it's not we, the, the snow itself has a significant uh, material uh, power to it. Um, again, this is another, this is uh, interesting, it's tilted to the left. Usually, almost always, it's tilted to the right. For reasons I'll explain. This is a snow melter contraption from 1928, so that you would put the snow on these conveyor belts and then not a melter. This is to pile it up into the backs of trucks that would then take it to the river and dump it. This is from the 1930s, um, not so different from a contemporary plow. And this actually, this is also from the 1930s. This looks on, an awful lot like the plow that is still in use. Um, it's a little bit different, but the basics, the basic <coughs> mechanisms of it are, are very similar. We don't have wheels on ours anymore, um, but this is not, the innovations in plow structure have not changed so much since then. So I'm just going to go through quickly a couple of famous storms from the 20th century. Anyone remember this one? Yeah. I wish I'd been here for this. I'm sure it wasn't all fun and games, but gosh, this thing is beautiful, right? In this, in this, uh, just this winter wonderland. Most of these images are from uh, Life magazine. Some enterprising set of photographers were on the street taking these pictures. This Times Square. There was not a lot of political fallout after this storm. There, people coped and the city responded and they plowed as best they could, as quickly as they could. And um, the, the press afterwards, there were not accolades for sanitation, but nor were there uh, condemnations for ineptitude. Um, these are V plows from 1962. You, you see a, it's a far more powerful possibility of, of shoving snow out of the way, although these trucks were, by contemporary standards, kind of small. How many of you remember the Lindsay story? Yeah. 1969? Yes. Okay. So John Lindsay. John Lindsay did some very interesting things as mayor. One of them was to create this uber bureaucracy into which he tucked many subsidiary, he made them subsidiary city agencies in, in a quest to be more efficient with city services and more streamlined. <clears throat> this didn't go over too well for many reasons. He also had, the year before, uh, had a difficult encounter with the Sanitation Workers Union, the nine-day strike in February 1968, so almost a year to the day after, uh, before the storm. Um, the new EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, I think it was called, I might have that wrong, but the acronym was EPA, it wasn't yet working well. And the forecast for this particular weekend was of mild weather, 
no snow anticipated. But from Sunday night into Monday morning, February 9th into the 10th, more than 15 inches fell on the city. The guy in charge of this new Uber agency was upstate somewhere. Nobody knew how to reach him. And because the Department of Sanitation in charge of snow removal was also keenly aware of the new administrative um, um, corridors of power and how you have to get permission to do X and Y, or if you don't, you're going to get hurt by someone up the chain. In other words, if, someone's, if you don't have permission to go out, maybe it's better if you don't go out. So, and the other problem was the equipment, uh, half or more of the sanitation's equipment was non-functional. So it was, a, it was a series of disasters that meant Queens in particular, and parts of Staten Island, were basically abandoned. Lindsay had already earned a reputation as being someone who didn't care about the other boroughs, who was a, sort of an upper class elite New Yorker. So finally he says, all right, I need to go to Queens. So he gets in his limo and he goes to Queens. But the snow stops the limo. So he gets in a four-wheel uh, Jeep kind of thing. That can't get through. So finally they go out on foot. But he's wearing really fancy loafers, oh, <laughs> which people notice, and they're like, you are so clueless, and all kinds of ugly things are yelled at him. And the press even <laughs> talked about his shoes. Like, what was he thinking? Oops, couldn't he move? So the Lindsay storm was one of the ways in which Lindsay was disowned by the Republican Party. And when he ran for re-election, it was on a fusion ticket of a temporarily created party so that he could run. And he won re-election but without the support of the people who put him in office in the first place. And it is now a marker. No mayor wants a Lindsay storm. It still is, I'm going to get to the storm of 2010, but that was, in some people's measure, the Lindsay storm for Bloomberg. So what are snow logistics? Well, this is the off season. I, I guess I shouldn't use this picture. It's a little artsy, which is why I like it. You know the shadows and the light. And these are clouds. In, these happen to be in Manhattan 9, which serves the um, West Harlem. Uh, neighborhood Manhattan. Um, they're, you know, they're put aside for storage during the off season. But during the off season, they are also um, there's a whole host of things to do with maintenance and repair and checking that the equipment is in good shape. These are the cotter pins. This is what holds the plow mechanism onto the body of the truck. They marinate in the oil all summer. Mm -hmm. This is a set, uh, these are spreaders. The spreaders. I'll talk about them a little bit more. Oh yeah, right now. So spreaders hold the salt in the back, and then um, the salt comes out the back, and you, whoever is operating the spreader has a very clear directive to what kind of distance that salt should fly. So if it's a broad highway, you're going to put it to maximum, and it's going to, it's going to go out almost at a right angle as far as it possibly can. If you're doing, say, um, a residential street, you want it pulled in a little tighter, or you're going to be dinging pedestrians and, and Fido and that, which happens sometimes anyway. The equipment is repaired and, um, uh, as I said, sort of uh, the entire inventory, you go over all of it, the um, conveyor belt that makes sure the salt is getting to its exit point, if there are any tears or flaws or holes, that's going to be repaired. Uh, until I saw this photograph, I didn't appreciate how long that conveyor belt is, right? That sort of tongue. That, that moves the salt. Um, the people who are, especially who are new to the job and have not yet been through a winter, there's a whole set of training that you have to master to when you are hired that has to do with things like putting the chains on the tires, which there's a magic to it, but you have to learn the magic. This is uh, here in the West Village. This is a spreader. Um, you're going to use salt on a snow <coughs> storm up to two inches, and then you're going to go to plows. But the salt will keep the ice from forming as the temperatures drop, and will keep the um, uh, keep traffic moving more easily. But after two inches, you need to move to a plow. Uh, this is just this is a um, is this called a holster truck or a love truck? I don't remember. Holster. It's a holster. Okay. So a holster is like a mini spreader where then you can get into tighter streets and corners. You see the, the this is in Queens, you see the um, chains on the tires. The chains, I will tell you, when I was on the job and was being trained in this, they do say, when you do this bungee, you have to have it cross at a right angle, and it has to be tight enough to be snug, but not so tight that you cut the tread of the tire itself. And if it's loose, you risk letting the chain fly off, and it will garret someone as they're walking down the street. 
Aunt Millie will be done in by your flying chain. Think how you would feel. Like, the, the terror of God. Like, we were all really meticulous about how we made sure the bungees were exactly right. Our salt comes from South America, comes up by ship to the Panama Canal, and then I forget its distribution plants once it arrives here. But we have a lot of it, and often not quite enough. We do run out, often in winters that are particularly long and particularly um, cold. This is the, the salt shed that used to be under the Manhattan Bridge. Oh, I forgot to include pictures of the new salt shed over on the river. The, um, that's amazing. Some of you may know of this. There's a new combined garage on the West Side Highway at Spring Street. And across the street from that is this, this <laughs> building that was built to imitate the shape of a salt crystal. So it's very sculptural and very with lovely, weird angles. And the architectural community in New York is kind of going nuts in a really good way. Um, <laughs> this is the salt shed that uh, has now been replaced by the one at, at Spring Street. This is, was the Manhattan Two. Your salt came out of here um, for, for many years. These are just pictures of snow. This is the 2003 President's Day storm. This is on the Upper West Side. Um, one thing that you know happens when it snows, you still put out your garbage. Mm -hmm. I still put out my garbage. We still put out our garbage. But there is only one workforce, <coughs> and it's doing now a very different task. It's clearing the streets of snow. So, but we put out our garbage, and it piles higher and higher and higher, and um, it then becomes a sort of uh, a task after the snow is cleared, you go to a job called chasing garbage. That's the one that they go and have it. And chasing garbage, so let's say it takes two weeks to clear the, the, the snow so that all streets are passable, everything is clear. It's going to take at least that long to catch up on the backlog. So the overtime, this is a mandatory, this becomes a seven day, 12 hour, seven day week, 12 hour day until everything's caught up. And yeah, you make good overtime, but you, pay for it in the sense that I know people who live far from the city who sleep, who sleep in their cars for, for days and days and days. Because um, it doesn't make sense to go home at 7 o'clock at night when you have to back at 7 in the morning and it's an hour and a half one way. Right? As I say, we keep making garbage no matter what. This is called a snow cone in sanitation. In <laughs> <laughs> um, I promised you a picture of a bee plow. That's a contemporary bee plow with the former commissioner of sanitation, John Doherty. This is a modern day snow melter. So you, you, you take the FEL, the front end loader, and you load it into this contraption, which does belch smoke and fumes. And it's, it's a bit unpleasant to be downwind of, but it's positioned over a sewer cap. So we no longer dump snow straight into the river. It goes through the water treatment system of the city and is then released into the waters, uh, adjacent waters, only after it's been treated. So that's an important thing to keep in mind. This is the uh, Bronx 12 up in the northern part of that borough. I, I like these side by side because it shows you a little bit just the sort of scale and the difference. So for the 2010 Christmas blizzard, um, how many of you remember that storm? Yeah. Okay. It was very like the blizzard of 1888 in that a storm was coming. Everyone saw that a storm was coming. Well, that's different. It, the one in 1888, nobody saw it. But for, for December 26, 2010, they were ready for snow, they were prepped for snow, vacations, days off had been canceled, the full force is ready to go, and then the snow starts to fall. And the snow starts to fall, and the snow starts to fall, and the wind picks up, and the snow, and the wind, and the wind, and the snow, and it is heavier snowfall and stronger winds than anybody predicted. Anybody at all. No one, no one anticipated the strength of that storm. So, they're sending crews all over the city, and the crews are getting stuck. And one of the, it's a sort of simple rule of sanitation, if you are in a vehicle that becomes disabled, you have to stay with the vehicle. But there were only so many wreckers, tow trucks, to come and pull them out. And eventually, there were far more trucks stuck than there were wreckers who could get to them. Plus, GPS was not yet a part of the, the system. So how do you find out where your trucks are in trouble that relies on phone calls and, and um, systems of communication that even now look a little old fashioned. Um, and then the wreckers were getting stuck. And then people were still trying to go out with their cars. And then they were getting stuck. So even if a plow is actually functional, couldn't get down the street. And meanwhile, Queens feels abandoned. Manhattan was more or less okay, relatively quickly. 
partly because the infrastructure underneath the streets of Manhattan keeps many neighborhood streets warm enough mm -hmm. that even when the snow sticks, it doesn't stick for long. Mm -hmm. But Queens and Staten Island and parts of Brooklyn, places where the subway doesn't really serve it and you kind of need a car, they were stranded. And they, uh, Michael Bloomberg, as you may recall, made the mistake of um, telling people to quit complaining and just go to a Broadway show. It's <laughs> <laughs> really not a savvy thing. <laughs> and someone kind of got in his ear and said, oh, Mike, that was kind of stupid. And then he came back and was like, no, no, we, yes, it, yes, very difficult, very hard. We're, we're out there, we're working. <coughs> um, but by then, the damage had been done. He also had brought in a deputy mayor of operations named um, Goldsmith, who uh, seemed not to be aware of the extent of the trouble until it was quite late. And at one point, he's, he's emailing or tweeting saying, great job, New York, fight that snowstorm. And people are like, fight, fight, what, fight? I can't even open my door. <laughs> so, and he wasn't in town either. So the mayor's in Bermuda. Goldsmith <laughs> is in Washington. The deputy mayor of operations is not in the city when there's an, uh, a weather catastrophe. Whoa, wait a minute. So the, the mayor was, this is when it began to be called the Lindsay Storm of the Bloomberg administration. Um, then a fellow, a councilman from Queens, whose name I have forgotten, he charged that some three sanitation people and a couple of DOT people had come to him and said, we were told not to plow. This was pushed back to this Goldsmith guy and the mayor, and we're mad at the mayor, so we were told not to plow. Well, that's, that's a crime. That qualifies as a criminal act. So then the Department of Investigation gets involved. But, so the headline on the post, of course, big, big headline, sanitation workers are deliberately not plowed, they leave the city stranded, and they, oh, they're fine, why <laughs> So I've talked to reporters from other outlets who said, we knew that this was malarkey, but when the post ran with it, we had to run with it too. So it's, it's screaming headlines in all the papers, in the news, in the, in the TV. DOI spends six months. They interview 150 people. They review surveillance cameras from all over the city, and they conclude that this councilman was simply lying. Mm -hmm. It wasn't true at all. But that got back page mentions on, you know, yeah. and they, no, that was not the 10 inch screaming headline. The end of the story with the councilman, just last year, he was charged and then charged with and then indicted for corruption so severe, he was sentenced to 20 years, 20 years in prison, wow. 20 years. I took great, great glee <laughs> in that announcement. Um, yeah, he, he made life very, very difficult for sanitation in ways that are still felt. Last year, there was a storm on the upper, no, when, when de Blasio first started, there was a storm that hit not long after he took office, and the traffic going over the Queensboro Bridge was quite tangled which backed up to the Upper East Side, which kind of basically made a gridlock. So the plows couldn't get in. But, but what the public saw was that their streets weren't getting plowed. So de Blasio starts getting slammed for the failings of the sanitation department when the constraints in which sanitation is working are such that they cannot. I mean, unless they had a plow strong enough to just push through cars and shove them up onto the sidewalks, which would be its own disaster. Um, so, I remember last year there was a brief storm, I think in February, and someone was complaining because there was a curb in Midtown in the 40s that had slush. The sanitation was not doing very much. It was like, never mind. The way that, that PR for sanitation put it was like, 70 storms. We we hit home runs, and then there's one big one where we had no problem. And that one big one erased all the public sense of success in the 69 that went before. So you still feel it today. Like, I'm very curious if we have real snow this winter. Will the press immediately go to the woman complaining about, ah, eh, they didn't have it. Or will they give sanitation a fairer assessment? I'm not saying the department never screws up. But on the whole, they do a remarkable job, and they're Always, always looking to do it better. Every, at the end of every winter, there's a, there's a, a kind of a debrief. Like, okay, what went well? What didn't go well? How can we fix it? Every October, there's a, um, a big meeting, the snow meeting. All the chiefs are called out to Brooklyn 
and they sit through, here's how we're going to do it even better this year. Here are things we're changing. Here are things we're putting back in place. Here are things we're never going to do again. Um, one of the many benefits of doing snow is that when there's a disaster like Hurricane Sandy, sanitation knows how to marshal big equipment to move large quantities of material very efficiently. And Sandy, if you recall, in the hardest hit neighborhood, sanitation was the first agency on the ground and the last to leave, even though many of the people working that storm cleanup had themselves lost their homes. There's one chief out of Brooklyn who lived in the trailer sleeping on a cot because his own home had been turned to kindling. But he couldn't tend to that until the rest of the city had been put back to normal. Um, so there's a big change taking place, and this is the last thing I'll say and then I'll, then I'll stop. There's a big change taking place gradually over the last two winters and into this winter as well. We used to organize snow response according to primary, secondaries, and tertiaries. You may recall this language from the press. A primary rep for snow plow includes hospitals, police stations, things that are going to be uh, firehouses, any emergency service. You need those roads cleared immediately. And then secondaries are the heavily traveled roads that you need for just regular sort of transit in the city. And the, set, the tertiaries are things like the dead ends in Staten Island, or the, the little cul-de-sacs that only are residential with no businesses and no emergency services on them. Needless to say, people who live on tertiaries don't really like that they are last in line. The new approach is called sectoring. So primaries are still going to get hit first, for obvious reasons. But sectoring now is going to be, you are, as, a, as someone with a plow, assigned to do all the streets in a particular sector. And when you're done with that, you go to the next. And all of the plows that are going to be deployed are going to be deployed in such a way that the sector clearing happens complementarily. So you don't have a clear chunk of blocks here and put your surrounded by snow, right? It's a, it's a radically different approach. Where it was rolled out the first year, it worked well. They rolled it out to uh, several more community districts. Uh, last year, we happen to know all of Manhattan is now in the sector system. And then this year, they're going to roll it out to several more until finally, I believe, next year, it will be citywide. Um, I just, I like this. <laughs> when, you, when you hear that there's going to be a snowstorm and if you park on the street, park on the left. Snow clouds are always tilted to the right um, for very uh, sound logistical reasons, but it means that if you're parked on the right, you're going to have to dig out. So park on the left. Um, there was, was there something else I was going to... Yeah, I think that's all for now. Um, I'm happy to take questions. I won't know the answers to all your questions. There are a couple of people here who can help me with those questions. But what I learned last time I did the snow talk is I will write down questions that we can't answer here. I will find the answers and get them to Ted and know, who will then somehow communicate them to you. Um, and I'm now going to point out two retired sanitation people. Angelo Bruno is over here in, um, the, on the far left. This is like, this is I'm particularly pleased to see Angelo here for many reasons, but for you all, Angelo worked out of Manhattan too, which is this district, for 31 years. He knows Greenwich Village extremely well. When he retired, he and his partner had an interview on StoryCorps that I urge you to find. It's, I, still, I still get teary eyed when I listen to it. Um, his partner's still on the street. I run into him uh, pretty often, at Eddie Nevis. But um, Angelo is a, if every sanitation person had Angelo's integrity and heart, the public would recognize us as being the essential service we are because he's such an amazing guy. So Angelo's one. The other guy who's here is Marty Ballou. He's retired also from sanitation. He's sitting off the <laughs> Marty was on the street in the Bronx, but then was recruited into the side of sanitation that deals with waste disposal. So he was in charge, before he retired, of Fresh Kills Landfill. Mm -hmm. And when September 11th happened, he was the guy who helped the entire city, sort of a, an alphabet soup of city and state and federal agencies, figure out how to organize the recovery effort at Fresh Kills. He was the linchpin to help that happen. People look at a closed landfill and think it's a static <coughs> place, but in fact, there's a whole lot happening right below the surface, which means you can't just pound a stake in the ground and put up a tent, right? So um, he, uh, 
he has he has uh, a remarkable history as well. So thank you both for being here, as well as all of you.